the Speaker, I can tell you that both initiatives will deliver more than what that last government attempted to when, for instance, they put out a $1 billion infrastructure scheme. Tēnā koutou, I'm Selwyn Manning and welcome to A View From Afar. And today we are joined by political scientist Paul Buchanan and we're going to discuss how recently New Zealand government confirmed its intention to be defined as an independent Pacific Island state where its foreign policy ought to be considered against the collective values that its people share and its diplomacy, if you consider it from a human rights issue point of view, will be expressed multilaterally with like-minded countries. That's how the New Zealand government put it. But how does this work in practice? Many see multilateral bodies like say the United Nations, being controlled by large global powers such as China, which has the pres presidency of the Security Council at the moment, and the United States of America, that the re this reality renders the United Nations Security Council in particular as toothless, cumbersome, and slow to react in times of crisis. Basically, this form of multilateralism seems designed by many to create a stalemate between great powers that assert their competing agendas. The effect, small countries lose their voice and influence on matters of global importance. So how do small players like New Zealand express themselves on the world stage? And how do small countries shape reform of global bodies so that they can work as forces for good, perhaps, in a world where geopolitics is divided be between polarised blocks? And the big question here today, is microlateralism a global collective of like-minded states? The answer is New Zealand, for example, about to stride out on the, on the world stage to assert this new form of multilateral collective bargaining. So to discuss these issues, let's cross to Paul Buchanan to debate the pros and cons of microlateralism. How do small powers around the world, um, like New Zealand, as a good example, I guess, um, gain influence and you know get into serious debate on the world stage? Uh, well, first of all, that was a good introduction that you offered. And I'll I'll come back to sort of speak about the evolution from multilateralism to microlateralism. But basically, the bottom line is there's strength in numbers. You know, small states simply do not have the capability to impose their will on pretty much anybody other than uh, competing small states. And uh, rare is the day where small states enter into any sort of serious uh, competition for a variety of reasons. Uh, again, most small states tend to be resource poor. We in New Zealand are fortunate because in spite of our isolation, the country is actually very rich in natural resources and human capital. Uh, so uh, strength in numbers is the motif. But here's, here's the issue. Uh, the current move to microlateralism, which is embryonic, it's just beginning, uh, stems from the failure of multilateralism, uh, as you described it. And basically, uh, we have to think of it this way, because the evolution, there are some, some paradigm shifts. The original concept of multilateralism was three or more states enter into an agreement or compact that is then institutionalized. I mean, there's actually an organization that represents these states. There are rules and norms of behavior that everybody voluntarily adheres to. And it becomes an ongoing, it reproduces itself over time. Clear example would be the UN, uh, you know, the World Health Organization, the WTO, those sort of things. But as you accurately described, what's happened in fact is that great powers dominate the decision making in these multilateral entities, and you get one of two results. You either get a great power or a few great powers dominating uh, all discourse and imposing their will on everybody else, or you get a stalemate, uh, what is known as mutual neutralizing between the great powers. And of course, the UN Security Council is a prime example of that. So the failures of multilateralism are clear. 
and have to be admitted, but no one wanted to do so for many years, as in a half century, because so much had been invested in the UN, regional organizations, military alliances, and that sort of thing. Well, after the uh, great financial recession of 2008 and 2009, a concept developed known as mini-lateralism. Mm. And mini-lateralism was, it had a very simple premise. You try to get the minimum number of states required to pass some type of policy reform in a regional or international setting. And it was less institutionalized. The idea was you get a sub-block of actors, let's say in the UN General Assembly, who would come together on specific issues, have the numbers in, let's say, the General Assembly to get a majority, and then start passing resolutions that reflected those majority numbers. Uh, just on uh, that point, can I just um, think, uh, given a sure. couple of examples there, and just would let, let's just apply this. Like, for example, particularly in the Helen Clark led Labour government of of New Zealand back in the 2000s, we saw New Zealand using the United Nations General Assembly to quite effect. And it was doing this, like what you've just described there, it was buddying up, if you like, with what they referred to as the CANS group, the, the Australia, uh, Canadian and New Zealand group. So you can see the like-minded nations, similar kind of um, governments and, and similar populations, although not identical. Um, and you also saw New Zealand aligning with some of the social democratic Scandinavian countries at that time and forming blocks like what you're talking about at the at the General Assembly at the United Nations to assert their collective uh, views on different things and try and actually get their, their way of how they would see things going, um, actually cemented, if you like, or strengthening up their, de um, their, their debating um, uh power, if you like, with the big global powers that obviously occupy and dominate such things. So just wanted to jump in there, Paul, and uh, just just um, bring that to light. No, excellent, e excellent points and illustrations of, of, you know, the good concept, the ideal concept of mini lateralism. And we have to remember that during the Cold War, we had the non-aligned movement, which mm. was a version of that, you know, they weren't going to go east or west, they were going to try to steer a path. Uh, down the center, India was, of course, the leader of that that group, which now only exists, you know, as a uh, uh, forgotten theory, if you will. Uh, but here's here's the interesting thing: those attempts that you describe uh, ultimately failed because of great power intransigence to join in those cooperative efforts, and and the organizations, the multiple multilateral organizations that exist around the world today are by and large funded by great powers. Mm. Again, small states don't have the financial resources to put serious money into the World Health Organization. And that in part is how China has come to dominate the World Health Organization because it funds it. And of course, Trump got so mad, he, he, he removed the United States from the WHO. So he cut off his nose to spite his face because he didn't like Chinese influence replacing American influence. Well, you know, the minilateralist concept was a very good one, but it fell hard on the sword of great power politics. Mm. Now we have the emergence of a view mostly championed by small states, and most of these fortunately happen to be democratic in their governments, which says, no, we have to go microlateralist. Yeah, what's micro the difference there? Yeah. Okay, micro in that under the mini lateral uh, approach to things, it didn't matter what the size of the state was. Right. And that was its undoing because the great states then came to dominate a lot of the mini lateral approaches and okay. dominate them in ways where the, the subordinate actors or the, uh, the weaker actors, you know, couldn't have a say. Everything got, got turned topsy turvy. Now, the concept of microlateralism is no, we don't want great powers involved. We want a small state led initiative that follows the minilateral principle of trying to secure the minimum amount of numbers required to enact policy reform. And let's remember, 
there are many more small states than there are great powers. Yeah. I was just going to ask on that. Um, for example, where where does the small state and regional power kind of uh, um, definitions kick in? For example, New Zealand, small power, as Robert Patman has described us in the past, and it'll be interesting to see um, your definition of the small power. Um, is is New Zealand perfect for this microlateralist type of approach? And is Australia, which is obviously a larger economy, a larger population, a larger presence geopolitically in the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific region, as a regional power, perhaps Australia, is it excluded from such things like microlateralism? I think Australia at this point would be excluded because it has uh, firmly tied its uh, cart to the U.S. horse, and uh, it sees itself as an emerging great power. I mean, Australia right now is a middle power, Mm. and what with the money it's putting into its military and what have you, it uh, it wants to become the Southern Hemisphere's first genuine great power, not Brazil, Mm. not South Africa, uh, Australia. So they're they're in a different boat. New Zealand, Mm. on the other hand, is ideally suited to be a leader. Now we're in New Zealand and uh, we, you know, we, we like where we are, uh, but there are other countries with very good reputations. I keep on referencing Uruguay, a yeah. very small state, but a very democratic state, a very peaceful state. You know, they've done no wrong by anybody, both internally and, uh, and uh, in terms of foreign affairs. And am I, correct, am I correct in um, saying, too, that Uruguay is one of the South um, American states that followed New Zealand's anti-nuclear stance? Uh, well, they, they supported it. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure yeah. that if they got a great investment deal on a nuclear power plant, yeah. that particularly now they have a right-center government in office right now after almost 20 years of a left-center government. The left would never allow a nuclear plant uh, in uh, in Uruguay, but we have to remember that just across the river from Uruguay and Argentina, uh, there are not one but two nuclear plants. You know, mm-hmm. Argentina uses nuclear energy for civilian purposes, and one of them happens to be across the the mar- marine boundary, the river boundary between Uruguay and Argentina. So mm-hmm. they already have, you know, they're they're acutely conscious and and, and the, the area, yeah. But I, I say that only because. Uh, you know, we tend to be very, you know, Anglo-centric, New Zealand-centric, yeah. and there are a lot of other states that share our principles, but not our language. You know, that they there's other countries that could be well suited to join us in these common endeavors. And the key here, though, is to keep the great states out, the great powers out. And the reason for that is simple. And actually, this is, again, where New Zealand could be very good. We have something here in New Zealand that I think is absolutely excellent under this labor government, which is we formulate well-being budgets. The guiding principle of the well-being budget is the welfare of uh, the least advantaged or poorest sectors of society. And this is new under um, the um, prime ministership and leadership of Jacinda Ardern from 2017 onwards. Before that, it didn't exist. No, but this is this is salutary because under this Labour government, they have made a priority of starting as a baseline with who are the most disadvantaged and how can we help them out? And not by throwing money at them and whatnot, but being judicious, scientific in the application of policy reforms that lift people up out of poverty, out of, you know, illiteracy, all the sort of, you know, human blights that exist even in such a good society as this. That's the intention, isn't it? So they're tested on that to see whether or not their their budgets, um, their policies, their manoeuvres are actually realising in in the real world those types of um, aspirational goals. Think of it this way. Um, we've had years and years under so-called neoliberal economic policies and public policies, uh, variations of trickle-down theory. You give money to the rich and somehow it's going to trickle down to the poor. Uh, this would be the fountain theory of public policy, where from the bottom up, you spray, you know, you spray, if you will, the public policy riches 
so that you lift people and that enhances the well-being of the entire society. Mm. Uh, that is a universal concept that I think would travel very well in other small states. And most importantly, and here's where microlateralism really has its, its bite, is that at the end of the day, and the pandemic has shown this uh, you know, exponentially, is it is small states, poorer states, less resource and down states that disproportionately suffer the adverse consequences of the mistaken decisions of the great powers. Okay, so, so if, we, if, if we were looking at the, at the Pacific, uh, the great blue continent, if we want to put it that way, so many um, Pacific Island states, many of them independent in, in their nature, um, that New Zealand is interacting with all the time. New Zealand has obviously been moving since the Ardern Covenant came in uh, four years ago or three and a half years ago, uh, to, to reconnect, if you like, to re-buddy up with a lot of these states outside the realm countries um, that we talked about in previous e episodes. Do you see the Pacific as seeing an advantage, particularly with the challenges of, uh, you know, the tyranny of distance with supply chains, with trade, um, with certainly climate change, um, and those other big issues like trying to actually protect their peoples from... Uh, pandemics like um, we're, we're grip in the grip of right now. Yeah, look, at there's there's a, you know, a couple of things factored in here. Um, first of all, let's be very clear. The, the small island states of the South Pacific, those that we see grouped in, for example, the Pacific Island Forum, yeah. are they're being made increasingly aware that the even though they're objects of attention, by certain extra regional great powers, the Chinese and the Americans in particular, the intentions of these great powers are not in the interests of the small island states. They're pawns in a bigger geopolitical game and they're coming to the realization that that's the fact. So they must look to each other and they do have already with the Pacific Island Forum, the South Pacific Conference, the Melanesian Spearhead Group, they have, or you know, organizations that are mini lateralist at a minimum. But here's the interesting thing about this: is that under the concept of microlateralism, it's not institutionalized. It doesn't become a self-reproducing array of organizations, norms, and rules. What it is is issue specific. So you okay. mentioned climate change. Yes. We in the South Pacific disproportionately feel the impact of climate change when compared to great continental states and not so great continental states. If you live in the middle of a continent, you may suffer, uh, you know, let's say Africa or North America. Uh, yes, you're now getting prolonged droughts, you're getting stronger rains, but even to this day, people don't recognize rising sea levels for the threat that it is. All that and nice yeah, they, countries like Tuvalu see it in a totally different way, or Kiribati, or, exactly. or um, um, Tukalau, you know, which is all within the scope of daily interactions at foreign affairs level between New Zealand and those countries. The, the, the concept of climate change refugee came up because of Kiribati and Tuvalu uh, in the first instance going back to like 2008. Um, so yeah. here we are, 13 years later, and issues based kind of the concerns are immediate. The responses obviously need to be immediate, and the voices in the global bodies that assist in representing. I don't say New Zealand's voice then speaks for those countries, but having to get a persuasive weight behind them on these big issues, um, it does make sense, doesn't it? In a, in a practical, applied sense, Paul. In the introduction, I used the word as some sort of foreign policy engagement of collective bargaining. Is, is, that, is that close to what we're talking about on any particular issue? Well, it's, it, it brings up the question of, of the, the agent principle question. That is, let's say New Zealand and some other small states could be the agents for change on something like climate change, let's say, or you know, sea rising. Mm. But the principles are other states states that are not part of the compact, but who will be affected by it. Let me give you an example. 
there, you know, given that we're talking about rising sea levels and whatnot, in my adopted home country of Argentina, outside of Buenos Aires, there is a massive delta uh, that extends northwards from the river plate into what is known as the Paraná River. That's that marine boundary between Uruguay and, and Argentina. Hmm. It is, it's, it's hundreds of square miles large, okay? It is a huge hmm. delta. And during my time as a kid and adolescent in Argentina, it was largely un uninhabited. So it was a wildlife preserve. Well, those waters are mangrovey, fresh waters. There's very little salinity in them. But over the years, as we've seen rising sea levels, the salinity of the river plate itself, which is more of an estuary than a, than a river, mm -hmm. and the river plate delta, again, right outside of Buenos Aires, has increased. And the delta is dying. You know, it's slowly but surely dying. And Argentines, particularly the people around Buenos Aires, are late to the game, but are realizing that rising sea levels have an impact on them, even though this delta is well inland from the Atlantic Ocean. A place like New Zealand and its neighboring small island states can make acutely aware to middle-sized countries uh, all over the world, that this isn't just our problem. It's our problem now, mm. but it's going to be their problem down the road. And so long as you know the great powers are quarreling to get to see who's dominant on the big stage and are still burning fossil fuels to fuel their competition, we're going nowhere fast when yeah. it comes. To so and one, what, one gets the sense at this stage that the time is right for the smaller states to actually pull together and to, to influence the outcomes. Like, for example, um, the United States under the presidency of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are making firm commitments this decade to reduce carbon emissions from the United States. It's obviously a, a big industrialised economy in its own right. So, you know, these are significant, aren't they? And the, the other areas are... Um, are, are, are clearly there too, where China, despite the trade conflicts it's having with the United States and the United States having trade conflicts with China, they have agreed in principle to work together on climate change. So the experiences, the might, the views and the solutions of the smaller powers, it seems the time is certainly right and it's at nigh to actually get involved on such things. Yeah, and I think we have to realize, I mean, you and I have talked about this before, the pandemic changed everything. Uh, as we have commented, mm -hmm. before, we're not going back to the status quo that existed before. Uh, things are going to change, whether we like it or not. And quite frankly, there'll be elite opposition because the elites benefited from the status quo that existed before the pandemic. But be it in trade, be it in geopolitical competition, but be it in things like climate change, environmental concerns, all of that has come to the fore because we've seen the failures of the market-driven system. I mean, I quite mm -hmm. frankly, my opinion, you may not share, is that the pandemic was not so much a public health problem as it was a problem of capitalism in its neoliberal phase. It failed to address the basic humanitarian issues involved in pandemic mit mitigation. Uh, even here, we we're a great success, but who moaned the loudest? about our, you know, pandemic mit mitigation uh, levels. It was, you know, the business class. You know, they said, oh, it's disrupting. But, you know, again, it, 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 it has proven that that model, that uh, model of production and distribution uh, is finished. And so something new has to come. And where microlateralism comes in, but, it, you know, you, you've just alluded to a potential problem. It can operate extra institutionally. Right. We can we can form, you know, micro blocks of nations outside of the U.N., outside of the OAS, that sort of thing. Or you could work within them and then simply say, we're going to ignore the Security Council because you guys just stymie everything. So we're going with, you know, General Assembly votes and we'll proceed without you. You know, we'll you mm -hmm. know, we'll put up together on issue specific things. What you alluded to that could be a problem is whether you get the support of the great powers. Exactly I, that, that question on whether or not it was some form of collective bargaining 
It was exactly what I was getting at there, Paul. That, would, it, would it, in its practical sense, and how it would be rolled out, irrespective of how big those uh, smaller powers microlateral blocks are, at the beck and call still of the major, large global powers that say yes or no? I guess the question is, how much do you need them? Let, let's use the example of the United States, because Biden has made these significant you know, changes. Now, if you can put together a mini group, a micro group of small, small states uh, led by the likes of New Zealand or Uruguay or Costa Rica, uh, that sort of thing, even, even, even states like Portugal. Portugal is not a huge country. Uh, but it certainly is in the community of nations a very, very robust democracy and all those sort of things. If as a block, and there's your collective bargaining, it negotiates with the United States under a Biden administration that is aware mm. of climate change and you know the uncertain future that, that holds for us if we don't address it now, then perhaps great power support can be beneficial. But I'd be very wary because inevitably what happens is two things. One, the great power then introduces its agenda into the microlateralist framework. And quite frankly, you know, it defeats the purpose of the small state leadership uh, uh, initiative once you get someone coming in with a different agenda that doesn't address. Okay. The, the other thing, I would just finish with that. The Achilles heel of democracy, in one sense, is the issue of governmental rotation. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean, if Biden is not reelected uh, or a Democratic successor is not reelected and the Republicans return to office in Washington, whether or not Trump is leading them, then we're going to see a reversal of U.S. commitments to whatever is negotiated. Uh, these commitments are binding only on the governments that sign them or agree to them. And that's just the way it is with democracy. In some countries, there is a consensus that spans the partisan divide. We happen to have some of that here in New Zealand uh, with regards to certain foreign policy issues. And that consensus allows governments of any persuasion to honor their commitments to the international community. I, quite frankly, in this day and age, would not rely on the United States to honor its commitments uh, anytime soon because the country is going through essentially a political crisis that may be a decade or more in resolution. So getting the big guys involved in a small state initiative, I think, could be a fraud issue, but it also depends on the subject. You know, if we can get into it, here's an example from the South Pacific. There's a lot of fishery agreements and treaties and whatnot governing the exploitation of fish resources in the South Pacific. They are almost as worthless as the paper that they are written on. You're they talking are written tuna, tuna resource, for example. In particular. Uh, but, you know, even shark har harvesting. Yeah. And, you know, we know who the culprits are. I mean, you know, without pointing fingers... There are great states who come down here and with impunity take everything they can out of the ocean, and the small states don't have the ability to confront them. You know, we don't have enforcement capability. Now, if we were to do a microlateralist approach that is very region specific, so the southwestern corner, let's say, of the South Pacific, mm. and get a state like Australia, we get a state like France, which has possessions in this neck of the woods. Uh, heck, if we get the UK, which for some reason seems to want to be reasserting its presence in the Pacific, and that's a discussion for another day, but if we can get them to come in and put some muscle into a tuna fisheries regime, a new one, you know, we throw out the old ones, bring in the new ones, led by the very small states whose fishery stocks are being depleted. So Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, uh, Tahiti, I mean, New Caledonia, Vanuatu. I mean, they're, 
These countries, I think, could actually lead because they are the ones that are most acute of the poaching and the depredation of these stocks, uh, much more so than even us, because we have some enforcement capability over our territorial waters. They simply do not. Mm. And that getting a middle power uh, such as France to come in and you know provide some of that enforcement capacity or capability, I think might be a good idea. It's just they have so, to be be told you're not running the show. You're assisting us in what is essentially a global problem that we're addressing in micro bites. So what we're looking there is um, a pragmatic kind of response of who can help us to reach a particular goal. Um, and if, 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 if the answer to that is getting a significant power alongside with mutual interests on an issues base, then there is possibility for a gain. So it's not total exclude other major powers out of, out of, this, out, out of the scheme of things here. Um, that's the way I'm kind of, kind of thinking through um, with what your response is there. If we actually take a jump back to the introduction once again, one of the criticisms um, identified there that we've heard for a long, long time is that large bodies like the United Nations, particularly the Security Council, are cumbersome to react. They're slow to actually uh, address crisis. And we all know that crisis explodes and expands at a phenomenal rate. And so you've got a global body like the United Nations. It seems the lag there is, is intolerable for many. If microlateralism becomes a force in this post-COVID pandemic period, do you believe that it would be able to, or it is a possibility where the smaller states that have been excluded from the discourse in many respects on providing solutions to crisis and conflict could be in such numbers as to insert and assert reform of the Security Council, for example, the veto um, clauses where the, the great powers can, can veto anything in their own self-interests. Do you think that that's a possibility? Um, I'm a little skeptical that uh, reform of the Security Council is A, possible, uh, but B, will, uh, will generate better outcomes. I mean, I think that it's, it's a relic of the Cold War. So you and alluded, sorry, Paul, you alluded earlier to the possibility that microlateralism with smaller powers and smaller states as a group uh, could exclude the relevancy of the Security Council and basically form a, a group in the General Assembly that goes alone to address crises or conflict or, or major issues. Is that a, a fair sum up of what you were saying earlier on? Yeah, you know, you made me think, you know, I, I'm struggling a little bit for examples, but again, because microlateralism is just starting, you know, yeah. we'll see. But let me give you an example. It's a strange one. But um, I think it'll illustrate the point about the specificity of the issues mm -hmm. uh, and the actors involved. It turns out for all the belligerent talk of the Trump administration, basically, the uh, the relationship between the United States and Iran did not, you know, move in one direction or the other uh, during the four years of the Trump administration. There was a lot of rhetoric. Uh, you know, he built up, he put the embassy in Jerusalem, so that would annoy Iran. But here's the issue. Because the United States talked a lot, but basically retreated from the Middle East, other than its engagement in Syria and northern Iraq, who turns up to try to negotiate more, you know, quiet diplomacy, private diplomacy, but diplomacy nevertheless, with the Iranians were the Arab oligarchies, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Kuwaitis. They have engaged in private, quiet diplomacy with the Iranians face to face about how to settle their disputes, including um, how to avoid the militarization of the Iranian nuclear program. And the chips, there's many chips that can be played. One of them is the Saudis have said to the Iranians, if you guys go nuclear, we're going to have to go nuclear. Uh, you know, we just, we can't trust your revolutionary guard. Mm 
And you really want to start that escalatory process. We're both oil rich, you know, countries, you know, how can we avoid stepping to the abyss? The issue here is that because of the United States retreat, the principles were forced to bargain directly. They didn't talk to each other directly while the United States acted as an interlocutor. And the United States was not an interlocutor in good faith. It was clearly on the side of the Arab oligarchies. It views Iran as an enemy. So out of this disaster that was Trump's foreign policy has come something quite beneficial, which is the Arabs and the Persians are talking to each other about matters of mutual concern, particularly in the security field. So it's a, region, a, re, a regional response to a regional problem. This is almost like what Condoleezza Rice used to talk about under the uh, George W. Bush uh, administration. I mean, maybe we're coming to the realization that, uh, you know, a, a, a bipolar or multipolar world dominated by great powers does not address the specific concerns of smaller states and given regions. Yeah. That they simply have other concerns, other items on their plate, and they're not looking with the intensity of focus that those who are immediately affected by an issue tend to bring to the table. And so now these smaller states, in the case of the Middle East, middle-sized powers, are starting to look to each other a lot more instead of looking to the United States for a helping hand. And I think that is salutary. And you know who's going to... Yeah wind up having to do a bit more of this is Israel. Yeah, of course. Uh, what, 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 I was, what I was going to say there is the test of its effectiveness. And once again, I underscore what you said before with respect to microlateralism is, is, is a new new thing on the block in some ways in the way that we're defining and expressing it here. The, tre the test of the, the, the Sunni states, if we want to put it in that way, um, and the, again, uh, in their talks with Shia interests, would be whether or not the Sunnis, who are close an ally perhaps, the Saudis, the UA um, states, etc., closer to the Western powers, the global powers like the United States on this, if they can convince to back off Iran, then... Iran has room to breathe if it doesn't have the threat that it perceives from Israel and it doesn't have the threat it perceives from how it would term perhaps the imperialism of the United States might on, on, on its uh, own uh, affairs, then there may be solutions in there. But it's too soon to call whether or not there are solutions actually in evidence, isn't it? Yeah, I think right now the, the microlateralist project is in the research and development phase. Yeah. You know, we're looking at, you know, the, the, the topics, the potential partners involved in those topics to see if we can develop a common language. I mean, I was thinking as you were, were talking, uh, Iran can give many assurances to the Sunni Arabs, but so long as Netanyahu is in Israel, and it is in his interest to foment conflict with Iran. No matter how much goodwill between the Sunni Arabs and the Shia Persians there is, you're going to have an Israeli prime minister looking for trouble. Looking to he, he, he's and, shaky on, 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 on his own. Uh, uh, he hasn't been able to form a government over the last few weeks, and uh, he's oh, running wait. out of time to do so. For the past uh, four years, yeah. they've had caretaker interim governments all run by him. But let's be honest now, Netanyahu is no longer interested, I would say, in, uh, in Israel's interest and certainly not regional peace. He's trying to keep himself out of jail. I mean, this is how bad it's gotten and so long, and, but it's a democracy and he's still getting votes. Uh, you know, it's for the Israelis to figure out whether they want to live uh, with this individual or, or have a more durable peace but that requires that they have a change of government and then engage. Uh, that, that is a really fraud. I mean, getting Israel involved in inter-Muslim discussions uh, at an early stage is disastrous. I mean, that would have to come down, down the road. My point simply is, is that maybe now uh, 
explorations could be made to see what exactly will get the Iranians to move in a peaceful direction, what will get the Israelis to move. You know, what exactly are they concerned about with regards to the Iranians? The Iranians don't have weapons-grade nukes. Mm. Uh, they do have the missiles to launch them, and they've shown a propensity uh, in other conflicts to fire off a few of those missiles. But what is the specific concern on all sides? And then try to develop a common language with which to address them. Now, I think that is one of the more difficult problems uh, to resolve in international relations today. So we shouldn't start with the most difficult problem in international relations. No. But certainly, again, we've talked about climate change, environmental degradation. Uh, you know, there's a host of, of subjects Human Where, rights in a general sense. We're getting back to the South Pacific. We're getting back to the Pacific, the Asia Pacific, the Indo Pacific regions. And where New Zealand has already asserted, as we pointed out in the previous episodes and also in the introductions, has asserted its own belief and, and defining itself as a, an independent Pacific Island state where it will make its own calls. And on issues like human rights and climate change, it will group with other countries that are, as it terms, like minded. And that may or may not include uh, its, its traditional kind of groupings that we mentioned um, e earlier on. So that microlateralism, it's almost as if the testing of it and whether or not it is a successful phenomenon in the next decade, people should be watching down here perhaps in the South Pacific to see whether or not its merits or otherwise. Well, I, I think that the South Pacific represents a, a natural... Uh, case leadership, if you will, because we do have, uh, you know, already existing multilateral forums. They haven't worked out quite as well as we'd hope. But if we're going to take the microlateralist approach, go with more specificity on the issues. Here, here's an example that also can feed into larger, uh, larger issues of human rights and whatnot. Let's say, for example, that we agree New Zealand uh, leads the uh, the agreement among South Island, South Pacific Island states that we are going to adhere universally across the region to international labor organization standards when it comes to workers' rights. Uh, so, you know, eight hour days, overtime pay, you know, the basic standard things that Europeans enjoy. What that will do is it will force investors like the Chinese who not only invest heavily in these small countries, but they bring their workforce with them. And so Chinese workers are brought into Tonga, brought into Samoa to do the infrastructure projects for a variety of reasons. You know, I won't get into the darker side of this, but if you impose and you got the Tongans and Samoans and Fijians and others to agree that everybody is going to adhere to international labor organization standards when it comes to workers on their soil, foreign or domestic, that will improve the material standards as well as the living conditions of workers throughout the South Pacific. The Chinese will have to adjust to that. Now, they may leave, so we have to be prepared to accept a decline in investment uh, on the case of some actors who simply do not want to adhere to these universal norms. I mean, ILO norms are global in scope, uh, but I can tell you for a fact that the Chinese does not adhere to ILO, ILO standards. And so if they leave, we have to set the fact that, you know, that investment is gone. That infrastructure may not be built sooner uh, because we're going to have to find replacements. And that has to be some of the contingency planning that goes in to microlateralism when you go into a contentious issue like the universal rights of workers. But it can be done. I mean, it's, you know, it, and, and we've talked a lot here in New Zealand about a values-based foreign policy. Now, you know, well, you know me well, and you know that I'm a realist, so I think, well, you know, interests should yeah. govern foreign policy. If you can layer values onto it, that's great. But keep it at the level of interest as a core. But we're talking about values, and that basically means de liberal democratic values. If we can form microlateral networks 
of liberal democratic minded countries, mostly small in size. And again, there's plenty of them. Mm. Uh, then we may have a movement. I mean, actually a movement based on the shared values uh, of equality, fairness, transparency, accountability, all the sort of things that seem to get lost when great powers start competing. And that's my hope for this is that, you know, we're now the third try on, you know, more, you know, more than bilateral institutions and networks. And all I can hope is that this try, if thought out, you know, you know, more fully, mm. might be able to compensate for the disproportionate weight given to great powers and extant multilateral organizations. Okay, Paul. Thank you for that. It's a fascinating concept. It's fascinating realism to it too when you look at it through the lens of the smaller powers, um, the smaller island states of the Pacific, the Asia-Pacific region in particular. Thank you for those who have joined us live and also for those of you who have joined us to view it on demand. Um, a view from afar will be back again Thursday New Zealand times around midday and that's New Zealand Standard Time. Um, until that uh, time next week, uh, we thank you again and take care. And we look forward to your company next week. Bye-bye.